Joe Chemist, welcome. Uh, if you're tuning in on this lovely Sunday outside, I just want to say thank you. I appreciate you. And even though I know there's not a lot to do outside, I hope you do get outside today at a safe distance from others or the ones you're sticking in this, sticking it out with and enjoy the nice weather. But uh, welcome. This is the third live review of this spring semester. Get pumped. We got, I got so much good stuff planned today, in part because of the awesome Joe Chemist that sent problem in. So thank you if you did. I feel like this is going to be the best quality one that we're going to have so far. And the way I want to do this is about maybe the first half or slightly less than that. I just want to just briefly skim over each of the four topics that we're talking about today, carboxylic acids, carboxylic acids, derivatives, um, ester enolates, and amines. Kind of just talk, hit some highlights, the most important pieces, or maybe some just catalog some of the reactions just so you have like some logical overview of what's involved in the scope of what we're talking about today. And then if the, the second half or more than that, it's going to be problems, problems, problems. I got a bunch of really good ones. There's a lot of flexibility with all of this material. I think you can do lots of different, there's the combinations are pretty endless. That's why I think it's really important that you don't memorize, that you truly understand. But I think the problems I do have a good wide variety of things you might encounter yourself on your upcoming exams. Um, but before we do get started, I just want to say if anyone watching this in OCHEM right now, if you are in your own, uh, you know, your own time, you're also working in some type of uh, professional health care um, role, maybe you're like a primary care technician, a PCT at a hospital, or maybe you're going to go to nursing school, or maybe you want to, you're working at a doctor's office or anything like that, or maybe your parents or your friends are, I just want to personally say thank you because you are the ones on the front lines really, you know, helping us combat the situation. So thank you from Joe Chem. I don't know if it means all that much, but I just want to say it. And, uh, and one other thing before we get started, if you want stickers, I have Joe Chem stickers. Follow me at Joe Chem underscore I on Instagram. Send me a message or like me on Facebook. Send me a message here or email me. Jorganicchemistry at gmail.com. I have lots of stickers. I'm giving them away for free. So just hit a boy up. I'll put it in the mail for you. And also, Facebook Live isn't my, my preferred method to do these live things. YouTube is so much better quality in my opinion. I need a thousand subscribers to get there. I'm chilling it about 410. Please help me make up the difference. If you haven't subscribed on YouTube, pop fire up a browser, go to YouTube. Go to Joe Count, click that subscribe button. I will love you forever. I already do, but I love you even more. And so, subscribe, that'd be amazing. DM me for stickers. And uh, without further ado, let's get this sh organic show on the road. Okay, so the first thing, first, you know, region I want to talk about is carboxylic acids. Again, this is going to be, I'm going to try and keep this brief. I'm going to get the clock up. I haven't done that before. I'm trying to really try and keep myself in check so we can maximize our examples that we can do. So what I, one thing that I have seen pop up, which I think sometimes trips kids up just because they're more focused on the new OCHEM that they've learned, which understandably, that's what you should be focusing on. But one thing I've maybe seen that is like a blast from your GenCam past is carboxylic acids, right? This is our functional group right here. Remember, for hydrogen bonding, sometimes you might get a boiling point question. You might get like, rank these things based on boiling point or whatever. Just remember, this is what you need. This unit right here you need for hydrogen bonding, right? A really powerful intermolecular force, right? This is a very strong partial positive H. This is a pretty strong partial negative oxygen, right? This can buddy up with another oxygen with a lone pair like this, right? And then a H would come over here. That's kind of the hydrogen bonding effect we get. Well, with alcohols, we can donate a hydrogen bond here. We can, uh, we can accept a hydrogen bond here. We can accept one here for the lone pairs. We can donate one here. So there's three total positions. Well, on a carboxylic acid, we have those same three. One, two, three, four, five. So if you ever get a boiling point question and it's kind of stacked up with alcohols and carboxylic acids, the carboxylic acids are always going to win because of the extra lone pairs on this oxygen right there. So something I've seen, very minimal. Moving on. So 
in carbon salt acid land, I'm really just going to be kind of cataloging, cataloging some reactions that you will see. I'm going to use a very generic carboxylic acid like this. Remember, if you ever want to reduce your carboxylic acid, you I know we've seen reducing agents like this before. NaBH4, first step, and then a second step of ethanol. This is not. This will work on aldehydes and ketones. This is a no-go for your carboxylic acids. To have this properly work, you need a really aggressive reducing agent, the most aggressive one out there. That is lithium aluminum hydride. And then a second step of acidic workup. And just be on completely the same page, a globally accepted abbreviation for this is LAH. So if your professor is showing you that, which I'm assuming they probably have, just know that LAH is completely equivalent to this and no matter what region of the world you're doing chemistry, everybody knows what you're talking about. Okay? So, again, like, if you've used Dibol, Dibol will not make this work. You need to go to the alcohol, you need your very strong reducing friend, lithium aluminum hydride. Okay? So now let's look at some reactions of carboxylic acids. Just going to do these very quickly. One that we will see in some examples that we do is if you were to have a first step of, say we had some type of a, you know, halogen species right here, this first step would give us a Grignard, right? We have an arrow Grignard, arrow because we're attached to this carbon inside the benzene ring. And point being is that we can use Grignards or what are known as hard nucleophiles, super reactive nucleophiles to attack CO2. Whoa. And when you do that, that is a great way to lengthen your chain by one. Right? See that carbon is this carbon. Just a dot to you know distinguish them. And then acidic workup just protonates this to a carboxylic acid. So we will see this in future examples, but just know. If you have a super strong nucleophile, you can attack CO2, lengthen your carbon chain by one, make a carboxylic acid, and we'll see this. This, I feel like, is very popular, not only as a complete the reaction question, but very similarly, it's an intermediate in a complete the reaction question. No, I'm racing and kind of going fast, but a lot to do, short amount of time. Just know that to also get a carboxylic acid, I'm sure, you all have seen this. If you have a nitrile and you hydrate it, you might have H2, uh, H3O plus, or someone might give it to you like this, or give you a generic acid. Just know that takes your nitrile and gives you a carboxylic acid, right? So one, two, three in my chain. One, two, three. Okay? Reaction we will see very, very, very uh, often in our examples that we will do soon. I'm going to just do this like this. We have carboxylic acids. If we want to make this a better electrophile carbonyl species, if we want to make this more susceptible to nucleophilic attack, you can use SOCl2 or PBr3. Basically, that's just going to do a little search and replace on this OH, and you will have either an acid chloride or an acid bromide, okay? So these are much more better. These are more readily... Uh, rear to go to be attacked by nucleophiles than your carboxylic acid. So, you know, you can see you go from a nitrile to an acid uh, halide of some sort. So just know these reactions. Again, just moving on real quick. Okay. Okay, so one thing is with carboxylic acids, we can do so many things well, now I'm going to show one example, but if I wanted to go from a carboxylic acid, and let's just say I had methanol in here with some H+, we will see this very, very often. I'm going to show one example of an addition elimination mechanism, but I'm assuming you are all pros at that addition elimination, okay? So what this is going to do is the very first thing, just like we did in carbonyl chemistry uh, with you know, acetals, imines, and whatnot, we need to activate this carbonyl carbon, and we can do that by protonating this oxygen. So what that does, does that. So what we will then do is we will add, we will take our nucleophile, which is methanol, 
and we will add to the carbonyl carbon, electrons kick up. Okay? Okay, so we got this. Okay? So we need to do a little bit of cleanup. I'm going to deprotonate this and protonate this. Just going to grab generic H, and I'm just going to have water grab this. Okay, so we have done our add-in, we you know, had our addition, Oof, grammar's bad. So we need to do our elimination. We formed what is called a tetrahedral intermediate. There are four things here. This is a tetrahedral structure. It's an intermediate because it's not sticking around. Your initial carbonyl will reform and we will boot a good leaving group. In this case, that's water. I'm gonna skip a cleanup step because I'm assuming you guys have all seen this before, but this is a great way to do many of the things we will do in these examples. This add, collapse, and kick off pattern is everywhere. So the combinations here are endless. I did carboxylic acid plus alcohol, and that gave me an ester. And you can see that there are endless combinations. I could do carboxylic acid plus carboxylic acid, and that would give me an acid anhydride, right? And we will see some of that in examples, but that's why this chapter of all chapters, I feel like is super key to not memorize. It, come down, it comes down to your organic fundamentals. You saw that we were in an acidic environment. We saw we had a carbonyl oxygen and we've done protonation on that oxygen so frequently. That was the first step. Then we knew that this carbonyl carbon is a little bit more positive because of the fact that a resonant structure exists uh, because of this protonation, any bad nucleophile or like not super great nucleophile can attack. You had a tetrahedral intermediate, had to do a little proton shuffling, collapsed it, boom, we got an ester, okay? So we will see this super, super frequently. This is how you go from carboxylic acid or anything basically to an amide or an acid anhydride or an ester or to a different ester and transesterification, okay? But moving on. Okay, so another reaction of carboxylic acids that, well, if you are to see this whatsoever, you're going to see this pop up on a complete the reaction question. So if you see, what I'm looking for, the, okay, a first step of PBr3 and Br2, and a second step of H2O, if you've learned the, uh, oh man, I actually forget how to pronounce it. The Hell, the Hell, Voldhart, something reaction. I should know this, I'm very sorry. But I call it the HVZ reaction. All that does is bromate at the alpha position next to your carbonyl, so this is your carbonyl carbon. As you go away, you can label this alpha, beta, gamma, so it's on the alpha position. Carbonyl, uh, carboxylic acid stays put. All you do is add a bromine. I've only really ever seen this on a complete the reaction section of a test but the mechanism is on Joachim. There's a whole video dedicated to it, so check it out if you want more. Okay, but we like free points, and if it's in the complete reaction section, that's where we will take them. Okay, so, so now if we look at carboxylic acid derivatives, here's where I do want to like slow down smidge, because I want to explain something that I think doesn't, doesn't always get the, uh, the tension it deserves and then it pops up on a test and yeah okay so if we look at these of the very 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 popular ones amide ester acid anhydride and uh, acid halide I'll just draw an example of each right below them so this would be an amide Ester, we know what esters look like. I mean, we know what these all look like, but acid anhydride looks like this. Two carbonyls with an oxygen in between. And acid halide, we just saw a few examples. It could be bromine, could be chlorine, but I'll just put an X right here. Okay, so one very popular question I've seen on tests is ranking the reactivity of these four species, okay? And it goes like we, if, if, I, if one's the most reactive, this is it. 
then this, then this, and then four, the least reactive is the amide. So if you need to explain why this reactivity trend is seen, or um, you, know, you have to do a ranking type problem, just know this, right? Reactivity comes out of two things in this situation. We need to think about how electrophilic carbon is. And again, I'm forcing terminology, but basically this just means how big is the delta plus on carbon in the carbonyl right here. Okay, that's the first thing. And then the second consideration is gonna be how good is the leaving group, okay? So the thing is with all of these structures, we have something that can, we can draw resonance. We can draw resonance like this. 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 So the thing is, is that we see electrons heading towards this carbonyl carbon in every scenario, right? So the reason why the amide structure is the least reactive is because in this resonance structure right here, plus, yeah, this type deal, in all these other scenarios, we're gonna get a positive charge on this oxygen, we're gonna get a positive charge on this oxygen, and then we're gonna get a positive charge on a halogen. All of those atoms hate positive charges. Nitrogen is no exception to that rule, but nitrogen is the most okay with it. In the pantheon of electronegativity, nitrogen is gonna be, you know, it does pales in comparison to some of these other uh, you know, contenders, I'll say. So let's put it this way. This is a heavy resonance contributor. So as a result, oxygen, or sorry, oh boy, the carbonyl carbon is not as electrophilic as it is in these other scenarios, okay? That's for, you know, that's number one. The other thing is that in, in like, you know, if we are attacking this carbon in terms of reactivity, think about this. Not only is the carbon not as positive as it is in these other scenarios, but if we had to, if we had to boot off, if we had to do an additional elimination reaction and have something attack, have this come up, have this come down, and then boot off this, booting off nitrogen with a negative charge, that is not a good thing. Remember, uh, ammonia, NH3, has a pKa of roughly 35. If we, that means ammonia is a terrible acid. If we force ammonia to lose a proton and be NH2 minus, this means, since this is a very weak acid, our conjugate base is gonna be very strong and not stable, right? It's very unstable, it's very reactive. So that's essentially what we're creating when we boot off this nitrogen in an amide. So the leaving group is not stellar. So the reason why that amides are the least reactive of these carboxylic derivatives is both of these reasons. The carbonyls, the carbonyl carbon is less electrophilic, you can see that through resonance, and the leaving group is not stellar, right? We get better with the ester because our leaving group is not N minus, but it's just O minus, right? No resonance stabilization, no resonance stabilization. So O minus is certainly better than N minus, right? So the, the leaving group is better. And as we said, in the, in the, uh, in the resonance structure, oxygen doesn't love this positive charge, so this kind of resonance structure is not as, as strong as a contributor to the overall hybrid as it was with the amide. But the, the leaving group is a massive improvement. Now, if we look at these acid anhydrides right here, think about what the leaving group is. The leaving group would be something like this if we went down, up, and then down again. So this is resonance stabilized. That's why acid anhydrides are much more reactive. And then when you get the, so the leaving group is much, 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 much better. And you can see also, since it's smushed between two carbonyls, there's more resonance going on, so whatever carbonyl carbon you're considering doesn't get all of the, the full force of these electrons coming into it via resonance. And then if you take your attention to the acid anhydride, if you think about kicking off something like Cl-, that's an incredible leaving group. Br-, incredible leaving group. So that's why they are super duper reactive. Okay, so I wanna do a quick ranking problem and then we'll be moving on.
Okay, so we take a look at this. I'm gonna try and not get. The thing is, I always get so excited about all this stuff, and then I spend way too much time on certain things that don't necessarily matter. Okay, so we got. Uh, oh boy. Oh. And then I'll put the last one down here. problem. This was sent in by Zach Miller. Zach Miller, you're the man. Okay, so if we take a look at these right here, and if we had to go, one is the most acidic species, or has the most acidic proton, four is the least acidic, how would we rank these? Okay, so sometimes when I look at these ranking problems, I try to find the, the most or the worst, right? The most or the least. So if we look at this, well, what we have in all of its glory. We have a lot of dicarbonyl type things going on. So we want to look for the maximum amount of resonance that we have, right? So when we lose an H plus and we dump a lone pair on a carbon, is it resonance stabilized? So the thing we're gonna be looking for to try to maximize is something in between these carbonyls. That's where we'll have kind of like the double resonance bonus. So if we take a look at this bottom structure, this position that is wedged between these carbonyls, there are no Hydrogen's there. We just have methyl groups. So kind of the best position is not there. So the most, so the H's we're actually considering are these hydrogens right here. All six of these are the same. And if we were to lose a proton and just have a negative charge right here, we can't draw resonance. We can't do anything, right? Because if we'll just break the octet rule at that oxygen, right? I can at least eyeball it here that I'm going to have resonance right here with these H's, even these H's, and I can at least eyeball it that I'm going to have resonance here, and I can at least eyeball that I'm going to have resonance here. So in all these structures, I'm going to say this is my least acidic. This is the worst. Okay? So now let's kind of keep going with that trend. So now I'm going to make sure I do these correctly. Yes. Okay. So if we look here. These both have the benefit of that carbon in between our dicarbonyl, and that is not the case here. We can lose, we can have a lone pair here, and we can draw one resonance structure, but here we're going to be able to draw both ways. So I'm saying that this is my second worst. That is, comes in third place. Now let's look at our two big contenders. They both have the same situation here. These are, these are the protons we're going to consider. Now here comes our carboxylic acid derivative uh, reactivity uh, stuff into play. This carbonyl carbon right here, in both of these scenarios, less electrophilic than these two because of the fact that these oxygens are going to be pushing electron density in via resonance, right? So, if we're going to be dumping a negative charge onto this carbon and this carbon, this carbon is going to be a little bit happier because the partial positives on these two carbons are bigger than these ones because of the fact that these are esters and these are just plain old ketones. So this one reigns king, this comes in a close second or second place. Okay, I really like that problem because I feel like there's a lot of analysis that goes on even though you don't think about it at the time. Okay, so I'm going to erase this and we are not looking back. Okay. So we will keep going. I really want to do that. Glad we got that in. Um, we're going to be doing a lot of reactions of esters, reactions of amides, reactions of acid and hydrides and stuff at the, uh, the second part of this review. But I do just want to mention that amides, when you want to reduce an amide, right? If you want to reduce a ketone, if you want to, or sorry, if you want to reduce an ester, if you want to reduce uh, an acid and hydride, if you want to reduce an acid chloride or a bromide, they all follow a very similar mechanism, but amides are different. When you expose an amide to LAH, the acidic workup, you don't do the classic, oh, here comes my hydride, I'm going to attack, 
do this and do this. You don't do that because of the fact that you will be booting off a super unstable leaving group. So, in fact, and I've never seen this mechanism asked, but please know if you, if you do need to know it, and if, I, if you do, I'll, I'll definitely make a joke in video about it. I've only seen this in a complete the reaction section of an exam, but when you reduce an amide, you actually just kind of get your magic SpongeBob pencil, your Doodle Bob pencil, and just erase your carbonyl, and you just get the underlying amine. Okay, so I just want to stress that it's really easy to grab points on this for complete the reaction, so I've seen that very frequently. Just wanted to toss it out there. Okay. And real quick, I want to just bring nitriles into the fray. Two reactions we will see very frequently with nitriles. Here's just a very generic one. We're going to see two. So I guess it's more of a difference in reduction. And, I, and this, this kind of holds true for many of the other carboxylic acid derivatives. If you use dibol, I'm going to try and say diisobutyl aluminum hydride, I think, versus lithium aluminum hydride, L, our boy, our, our good friend, LAH. Okay, this is much more aggressive, this is much more mild. What you'll see here is you actually just reduce all the way to an amine and never get tripped up when you do nitriles because you go from explicitly drawing the C to probably not explicitly drawing the C, so don't lose a carbon. But if you do dye ball, you end up, you basically, so this is adding hydride twice. It's a hard nucleophile, it's going to attack two times. So times two. But up here, you just do it one time, one X. And what you end up getting is you go through an amine intermediate. And then when you pump water back in, that imine flips to a carbonyl. So basically when you do dye ball to a nitrile, you end up with an aldehyde. It's like it comes out of nowhere, but it's because you have H minus attack here you create this, and then since you're pumping water back in, plus water, you get an aldehyde. So again, another thing we're gonna see very frequently. Okay, so I think that go, that, that's like the end of the little overview for carboxylic acids I wanted to do. Now I wanna just touch on one thing regarding ester enolates. One thing before we quickly splash into amines and then we get our hands dirty with problems. Okay, so when you're doing ester, when you're working with ester enolates, and specifically when you're doing clays and condensations, I just wanna make it extremely clear. So here, I'll just say, let's have something like this. There's an ester, and then let's just say we did a first step of LDA, and then, actually, we're just even, yeah, let's just do, let's just do LDA. We'll make this so that we produce, LDA is just gonna do alpha deprotonation. We'll make an ester enolate. Okay, right? So we know that this is the carbon that's gonna be doing the attacking. That is where we are making bonds from. So we would then run into another of itself, right? Another ester, one's an enolate, one's an ester. We're going to attack right here. So when you do a clays in, right, we're going to attack from here, and electrons swing up. ETO. We reformed our carbonyl here. I'm bonding from here and bonding to the alpha, the uh, carbonyl carbon. So here's my O minus up here, and off of that, this dotted carbon. I know I had. Uh, an O ethyl as well as a methyl and then on uh, yes yep that looks good okay so then this tetrahedral intermediate will collapse and the only thing we can boot the best leaving group we have is the O ethyl which isn't spectacular and I bring this up because the one thing you need for a clays and condensation is when you boot off that leaving group this is not the final product but when you boot this See, we just have this left over. 
that position in between your dicarbonyl, that needs to at least have one H, one proton available for the thing you kicked off to come back and snag. You need that. You absolutely, absolutely, absolutely cannot skip that. So then up here, basically, you'll have, you do have a lone pair here, but what I maybe should have done was a second step of, you just always need a little bit of acid just to clean it up. So then this will grab H plus. So yeah, I'm gonna draw this down here. So your final product, you always get that with a clays and condensation, that characteristic 1,3 dicarbonyl. But what's not visible, unless you look at the mechanism, is that wherever you're attacking from, make sure that there's at least one H, there's two here, which is great, but at least one H. Otherwise, this step can't occur, and this is the deal breaker. If this doesn't happen, the whole thing goes backwards, and you don't do a clazen, period. I wanna show you an example of that. So for example, if I had something like this, yeah, this will do it. Let's say the first step of LDA and the second step of, you know, let's just do a, oh, methyl, okay. So the first thing, is that we will form this ester enolate. Whoa, whoops, whoopsie daisy. This ester enolate, right? Because we'll deprotonate this position. We'll have this swing down, these kick up. Then we bring in the, the very ester we're going to attack. And I'm gonna abbreviate this as pH for that ring. Remember, I'm bonding from here. So that'll kick up, and then I'm even gonna save some space by doing this, okay? It's so basically just an addition, the additional elimination, swing down, boot that off. Remember, that's not a great leaving group for us. So it's at this point that we reach the make or break point. So it's from here to here. All right, no, yeah, here we go, that's the bond. Wait, just kidding. We're bonding from here, I'm so sorry guys. We are bonding from this position right here. So we have two methyl groups down right here because this carbon's attached to CH3s right here. Oh my gosh, I'm really sorry guys. See, that's what happens when you skip steps. Here's what we have going on. Whew, very sorry. Attacking from here, this carbon right here, doing this. It's at this point that the grumpy O methyl minus methoxide comes back and says, okay, the deal was, the only reason why I left is that you promised me a proton that was wedged in between these carbonyls. And you can see because we have two methyl groups right here, there is no H here. There's just a CH3 and a CH3. So this reaction never happens, no reaction, okay? Just wanna highlight that. So make sure if you're doing clazin, it's really if you're attacking from a tertiary carbon right there. The alpha carbon is tertiary because you can't satisfy that proton requirement. Okay. Very important. Sorry for the little mishap. Okay. That is one thing I absolutely wanted to highlight with ester enolates. Okay. I'm pretty sure. And maybe, maybe to this point, the one thing I did want to specify is that when you do have these characteristic, uh, these one, three dicarbonyls right here, these beta, because they're, you know, alpha, beta, they're beta dicarbonyl. It's important to note that this position right here is very acidic, right? We want it to minus H plus, you know, have it donate a proton. You can see the fact that this Structure is super stabilized by resonance because we can do that. Where we have O minus. And I won't draw it, but you can see we, I easily could have done it this way as well. 
So lots of resonance. L electrons are absolutely delocalized. So if this carbon loses H+, it's not the only one that has to bear the additional charge. We got a delocalization between these three atoms right there. Okay. Very, very, very big. Uh, so what you'll see is if you ever have this, it's super easy to turn this position into a nucleophile, this carbon to be very nucleophilic because it's super easy to deprotonate. Okay, so another thing I want to highlight for these ester enolates, last thing too, will be, and then we do means, then we do problems, is that be very wary, be, be very on alert. If you have something like this, I'm going to make this like a, an ester of some sort, right? Like a diester. Let's say they're the same. Let's say R, like R is the same. If you ever see this, I feel like it's very popular in complete reaction questions. Uh, if you ever see NaOH, H2O, then a second step of kind of like a catalytic acid or just H plus, and then you see like, um, is that, uh, actually just kidding. If you see something like this, and then you kind of see heat, what is going to happen here is the first step is going to do something like this. It's going to just get you back to a couple carboxylates, basically deprotonated carboxylic acids. And maybe there is an in-between step where you go back from the ester to completely fully protonated carboxylic acids. Um, and actually, yeah, that's probably what, yeah, hold on. Sorry, I keep flipping the script on everybody. One, two. Uh, yeah, and then we'll get back to this. So we get back to a full-on carboxylic acid. So then if you see heat, maybe heat right there, what you're going to do, step three, you're going to be doing a decarboxylation. Okay, so whenever you have this situation where maybe maybe this is just a ketone, maybe it's a carboxylic acid, but what you're going to have happen is, draw up a little mechanism, I'm going to draw this differently, right? I did nothing, I changed nothing about the structure, I just drew, I basically just flipped these two. Basically what the heat will do is that we will lose this proton is going to jump over to this oxygen right here. This oxygen is going to take one of these bonds, grab that. This is going to swing down. Basically, we're creating CO2. Right? So now this carbon has two bonds here, two bonds here, just like carbon dioxide does. But it needs to break off of the structure. So to completely sever that bond between the two, quite literally, these electrons come here. So what is you have is you basically make a temporary enol and you create CO2 and then this structure quickly flips back to this. And I know I basically just retaught decarboxylation, but I think it's super easy to forget how this can be quickly integrated and complete the reaction questions and synthesis in some ways, okay? So watch out for that. Okay. That does it for what I wanted to skim over with ester enolates. Let's just quickly dip our toes in the amine pool and then we'll get our hands dirty with problems. Kind of right on schedule, which never happens. Okay. So, with amines, one thing I do want to bring up is if you have a tertiary amine, let's just say we had, we were bonded to CH3, we were bonded to F, an ethyl group, and let's say we were bonded to a propyl group. So what I basically want to say is we have an amine bonded to four different things. You would think this amine is chiral. And by everything you learned by stero like uh, regarding stereochemistry up to this point, or when you learned about this topic, you would be right. You'd be 100% correct. Four different things. Yeah, you know, we're counting the lone pair as a unique position, right? This would be non-superimposable on its mere image. However, if you had a little beaker of this, my artiste, artistic abilities, if you had a beaker of this and you flashed some light, plain polarized light going this way, 
at it, you would probably expect the plane of it to be rotated, right? Because of the fact that this is chiral, which means it does rotate the plane of polarized light. However, what you would see is that it does not rotate. The reason being a means do this thing. They have this, uh, it's called nitrogen inversion, or I, I'm, I was introduced to it as amine inversion. Basically, the activation energy is super low for this to occur. Basically, you know, this is a trigonal pyramidal structure. What will happen is because just even your room temperature will make the nitrogen kind of take all of its groups and flip them in and out, like picture like an umbrella blowing in and out of the wind, and this constantly happens. And then in the middle of that transition state, in a way, this would be the CH3, this would be the ethyl, this would be the propyl, you have your lone pair kind of mimicking S, like a P orbital, so it's almost like your amine is temporarily sp2 hybridized. So you're constantly flipping between the state where, and again, this is, this is a bad drawing, what I'm drawing up top, but I just want to, I do want to bring it up that you do have this constant amine thing going on where it's basically an umbrella blowing in, you know, inside out, then right back in, inside out, right back in. It goes through this transition state where it mimics sp2 hybridization. So it's almost like this amine is its own racemic mixture, okay? I've seen this, act, this question asked on tests before, so if you get it, you know, does a tertiary amine or does an amine bond into four different things rotate the plane of polarized light? The answer is no, okay? So just wanna bring that up. It can come up, it seems like a silly thing to lose points on. Okay. Okie dokie, let's keep going. Um, really just kinda wanted to show two more reactions that we will be using in problems. Again, we'll bring back our good friend, the nitrile. And I just want to show you two ways of kind of producing amines. So if we wanted to get this as well as, yeah, well, actually, hold on. Just the nitrile for this one. To get from here to here, right? We see we have a nitrogen source right here. And if you think about it, right, carbon is triple bonded to this nitrogen. Nitrogen is more electronegative than oxygen, or carbon. Carbon. Carbon loses these this electron battle, so it's pretty strongly po uh, positive. If you were to reduce, we need to reduce this to get to that state. So if we are throw it, bring our enforcer friend back, lithium, lithium aluminum hydride with some acidic workup, that is enough to take a nitrile to an amine, okay? Another reaction that I've seen very sneakily worked into um, a lot of problems is say we had something like this, something that was really good for SN2, what you can do is if you can get an azide ion on there, basically if you can get N3- minus on there, which is a good nucleophile, if you get N3- minus there, I guess this is more so the reaction right here, and you toss in some PPH3, some triphenylphosphine, as well as water, you end up with, you basically take your N3, your azide ion, and you make it an NH2. So the reason I wanna kind of bring these up, so this would be a first step of this, and then a second step of PPH3 and H2O. We have two carbons here, and that's where our NH2 goes. What I wanted to bring up about this is in the production of amines, right? This, These are two ways. Be careful though, because this is, uh, if it maybe you're saying you're introducing the CN minus, this is an easy way to get your chain to be one carbon longer. This is a way to keep your carbon chain the same, okay? All right, so that kind of glossed over the points I wanted to make. And we are about halfway in on the mark. So now I just wanna really kick it into overdrive, go crazy, do some examples. I know I got four of you with me and I love every single one of you. Problem City. Okay. Okay, so we do not need, I'm just kind of getting myself. Oh, and I 
didn't explicitly go over reductive amination and the monic reaction, but we will be doing examples with them. And I'll make sure to do more. The thing with these, with these problems is I'm going to be able to do a little bit more, provide more detail, and just give you the answer. Okay, so what I want to start off with first is if we have this ester. Okay, cool. So what I want to do is kind of do a bunch of, do the type of thing on exams where there's a bunch of reaction arrows. I'm gonna get a different blue gang. Sorry, this blue kind of sucks. Here we go. Out of business. Oh yeah. All right, cool. So let me just fill these in real quick. Sorry, I know this is not. Uh, couldn't do it beforehand. I don't want to even do this in black. I will make sure to actually state out loud what's going on because I know the visibility to the board is not perfect. I know I can see it perfectly, but that does not mean y'all can. So let's do. This is going to be a great primer for all the things we talked about with carboxylic acid derivatives. So we have an ester here, okay? And let's tackle this first one. So what I'm seeing is NaOH, H2O, and H3O+. So remember, it really doesn't matter what is over on all these arrows. What it's going to boil down to is some nucleophile coming in, attacking, and then we're going to boot these up. We'll form a tetrahedral intermediate. We'll boot these back down and then we'll kick off whatever our leaving group is. Now, what, how strong this nucleophile is, that will vary, and that will truly you know, to, uh, dictate what the reaction is gonna do. If we have a soft nucleophile, we will attack once, one attack. And if we have a hard nucleophile, and we have enough of it, we'll attack twice. Now, for hard nucleophiles, right, these are our crazy reactive things. These are our Grignards, our organolith, so basically, and our organolithiums, so basically our, yeah, organolithiums, our Grignards, and that hydride from LAH. Anything else is considered soft, okay? So, in my experience, those, these are the hard nucleophiles I've run into, and then everything else is soft, and that's like the easiest way for me to avoid memorizing individually. Is this hard or soft? Or is this hard or soft? There's just a few hard nucleophiles, and most everybody else is soft. So if we take a look here, hydroxide is our nucleophile that we're dealing with. Basically, what this means is we're going to take the ester and we're going to do ester hydrolysis. We're really just trying to get a carboxylic acid back. So after step number one, I hope you'll see that we have this. We have O minus. I hope you know we, we have this, right? Because basically, hydroxide comes in, it attacks, we kick up, we kick down, we boot off. And then the second step is actually just work up. So if you do base catalyzed ester hydrolysis, you know, you'll stick with this, you'll have this uh, ion left over. But if you tack in some. H3O plus, that gets you to a fully protonated carboxylic acid at the end, okay? So now if we look here, basically it's the same thing, except all I'm swapping out is I have this obnoxiously large alcohol here. So this alcohol is just going to attack, 
electrons kick up, electrons kick down, we'll boot off this methoxide. And I really should have given myself some more room, but all we're gonna have here, one, two, three, four, five. So I hope you see that this part is from the original ester. This is from the alcohol. And all we did was just take this section, toss it out, and slide that in, okay? So if we look here, I see an ester, I see an amine. Same deal. All I'm going to be doing is attacking, kicking up, swinging down, and booting off. So I'm basically taking this and replacing this here. So instead of an ester, I'll have an amide. So let me just even draw this. And instead of an oxygen, now I have my nitrogen. And be careful with nitrogen. I see an H here, but if I had an H on my final product, that means nitrogen would have a one, two, three, four formal charge and a positive. I know I'm not showing the work, but since it's a tertiary amine, we'll have that lone pair there to make sure nitro nitrogen is neutral, okay? So now, right here, this one I wanna actually do some, some of the work for. So, since we have excess of this uh, CH3MGI, right? This, uh, this Grignard uh, iodide type deal. Basically our nucleophile is this really reactive CH3 minus, okay? Rear to go, rear to attack. What's going to happen is, and I hope electrons are coming from carbon, we'll attack here, electrons kick up. So let me just draw this over here. O minus, a new CH3. One, two, three, four, five, okay? So what's gonna happen is we have a tetrahedral intermediate. We'll collapse that sucker. And our best leaving group is this right here. So we'll kick that off. So now, and I'm gonna draw this on this side. So I have the new CH3 over here. I have a ketone. And one, two, three, four, five. Well, I had excess Grignard. So another Grignard's gonna come in. And this attack is much more familiar to us. This was an OG attack we've done. And one, two, three, five. Okay, so I hope you're seeing that these are the two new CH3s that I've added, right? And then with this second step of acidic workup, all I'm gonna do is just quench that negative charge, quench the uh, alkoxide right there. That's our product. So, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. So if you're seeing one, two, three, four, five, these are our original carb carbons from our ester, and these two CH3s are the new kids in town, okay? So, similarly, we have a, new, we have a deal right here where this was a hard nucleophile and I added twice, and I should really specify that this is excess, okay? So, there is a slight twist here, and I know some, some professors love to do this, and some students have seen this type of thing, slight, you know, little gotcha thing before, some have it. All this is is, you know, this is Li, this is lithium aluminum hydride. However, instead of Li, Al, D4, or H4, it's D4. Deuterium is just hydrogen with an extra neutron. So it's a little heavier, so in stereochemistry land, or in organic chemistry world, we should draw deuteriums explicitly. Not even we should, we have to. So basically we're doing attack like this twice. Deuterium comes in, these kick up, they swing back down and we boot this. We would then have a deuterium, one, two, three, four, five. So this is an aldehyde, right? And since we have excess, deuterium comes back We have a D, another D, an O minus, one, two, three, four, five. And the second step will just be quenching this charge with H plus, okay? So be careful if someone throws deuterium your way. You don't wanna have them shake you. Just stay calm, cool, and collected. You just know it's hydrogen packing a little bit, a few extra pounds. Hydrogen that's been in quarantine, okay? So this last problem, we see dye ball. 
Now, dye ball, dye, isobutyl, aluminum hydride, all dye ball is to us. I hope when you see those big capital letters, all you're thinking about is H minus, but H minus, that's mild. It's not a hard nucleophile. This is reasonable hydride. It's only going to add once. It's, it's, your, it's your halfway point to lithium aluminum hydride, okay? So this just means you're gonna reduce once. So basically, if you just want to do the mechanism, we're just having H minus come in. This kicks up, this kicks down. We boot this off. So what that would look like is we have an H here, and then a one, two, three, four, five. It just steps you from a keat, uh, an ester to an aldehyde, okay? So I really feel like this could be some type of question on a test where, you know, I don't have, I'm limited by my whiteboard space, but this is in the smack dab in the middle of a piece of paper and you have arrows flying off everywhere and you just have to do this type of analysis over and over and over again. But I hope you all saw that it was somewhat repetitive actually because it all boiled down to just asking yourself, am I doing this once or am I doing it twice? Right? Is it a hard nucleophile in excess or is it a soft nucleophile? And, and then from there, it was just add, create a tetrahedral intermediate. You know, maybe you have to shuffle protons depending if you're uh, in what environment you're in. Collapse it, boot something off, and then ask yourself, should I do this again or should I stop? And we got all these answers right here. So this, 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 and this. Okay? Cool. So what I'm going to do, go ahead and erase these. Let's keep chugging along. Let's get through as many as we can. So I have two good synthesis problems. Okay, so I like this problem right here. Got this one in from Sydney. So Sydney, you're the homie. Mississippi State for life. Okay, so if we look at something like this. Okay. All I've seen here, yes, we see hydride. And we see we have an alcohol, we see we have an acid and hydride, right? That's the characteristic carbonyl, oxygen carbonyl. So what's going on here? So we think we maybe might be attacking the carbonyl right off the bat. However, the thing is, when you have a super, super, super strong base, like hydride, super reactive, if it can do a quick and dirty acid-base exchange anywhere, it's gonna do that first. So the thing with this problem is the first thing you're doing is this hydride is gonna rip off this proton right here. Electrons go on to that oxygen. So we actually get a pretty cool thing going on here is before we even attack and just do a straight up reduction, we actually do an acid base reaction, which sets us up for this oxygen to be more nucleophilic than it was before. Now think about this. We can have this oxygen do an intramolecular attack, which is always preferred, right? Because you're doing something within a molecule. Entropy is good. So let's, whenever I see a situation like this, I always start counting carbons because we're gonna be forming a ring and we need to make sure the number of that ring is what we want it to be, like, you know, something stable. No ring strain. One, two, three, four, five, six, right? Ding, ding, ding. We always wanna form a six-membered ring if possible. Zero ring strain. So what's gonna happen here is we will attack and electrons will kick up. So I'm going to draw this benzene ring because I didn't touch that. And what I always like to do is do a one, two, three, four, five, and six. Number of the carbons that are going to be a part of this ring. So I see that I'm going to have an O minus, and that's six. Six, five, four. Then I need to draw three, two, one. And one happens to be an oxygen, so I'll draw that in. There's my ring. And then I need to fill off the things that are in carbon six, right? Off of six, rather. So let me do a, off of six, right? I have this oxygen, the rest of the acid and hydride. Well, we just formed a tetrahedral intermediate. And we did the addition part of this addition, elim addition elimination mechanism. So let's eliminate. Let's swing these down and boot this thing off. And if you think about it, this 
is just acetate, which is resin stabilized, this puppy is an excellent leaving group. So our final product being this right here. I really like this problem because you think it's just going to be attacked with your nucleophile at the beginning, but it's truly just an acid-base reaction that then supports an intramolecular attack. So great problem in this guy's opinion. Okay, so with that done, look at 30 more minutes of fun. So if you're with me, if you've newly joined, thank you for carving some time out on this wonderful Sunday in quarantine. And if you're watching later after the fact, well, I guess you're too busy to make it. Feelings only hurt a little bit. Okay, so let's do some rapid problems. Oh, no, not that. So if we look at something like this, we have a first step of LDA and a second step of this. Okay? So what I'm looking at here looks like almost like a, like a Claisen type of condensation because the first step, what we're going to do, is deprotonate at alpha position. This is symmetrical, so it doesn't matter if we work here or here. We will be generating an enolate that looks like this. Okay? Then, we have this going on. Okay? So we're definitely going to be swinging these down, attacking from this carbon, and booting these up. So this will look like, we got this, we're bonding from this carbon right here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw this methyl group down and I will be bonded to what it was the carbonyl carbon, right? Found an O minus. And then we have a methyl group and an OET. This swings down, boots this off. And remember our criteria check, or our one, criterion, rather, for a uh, clason, right? This O ethyl, this ethoxide, is going to come back looking for some answers in the form of an, a proton to grab. And look at that. We do have a proton available there. So this clason connotation can go forward. We will have this happen. It's a lone pair on that carbon. Okay, and the reason why we, oh, I forgot it. I forgot to put H plus work up, right? This H plus is just gonna quench this carbon right there. So our answer is this lovely one, three dicarbonyl right there, okay? Just a straightforward clasing, but remember, you need to look if when you form your product, initial product, right? You need to, this, this acid base that has to happen. So if that H, if a proton isn't available in between the two carbonyls, it's a no-go. It's a straight up no reaction. Okay. I feel like we got some real cool ones coming up. So buckle yourselves in, gang. Okay, so let's take a look at So remember what we have going on here. We see we have a nitrile. We see we have a mild source of H minus. This is gonna add just the one time. And what that intermediate will look like is something like this. Something like this. And then when we hit it with that second step of water, remember this imine is going to flip to a carbonyl so whenever you have nitrile that is submitted, you know, subjected to some dibol and then hydration after the fact, we got a carbon right here. You just end up with an aldehyde. Okay, cool. So let's take a look. I like this problem. Again, this is from Sydney. Sydney came up big with the uh, with the gems. I feel like this is a little blast from organic past.
change it a little bit, but here we go. So if we take a look at this, we need to predict the product. So we see we have this alkene, and if you don't, you know, this, I thought this was a pretty unique problem, but these first two steps right here, this is some tail end of OCHEM1 stuff. This is ozonolysis. And how it plays in here is that, remember, with ozonolysis, you get your molecular scissors out, you snip right there, and you form carbonyls here and here. You always need ozone, but depending on whether you follow it up with peroxide or zinc, you get different things. So in this case, because we use peroxide, you actually get, I'll draw the first kind of step one, two down here, you end up with carboxylic acids, which is absolutely what we were looking for. So we're more concerned about the bigger chunk of this molecule, not so much the little one carbon piece we're gonna form. But then if you see what step three is, we basically have acidic conditions and an alcohol. So all we're gonna be doing is step three, we will be protonating this and just be doing esterification with this isopropyl alcohol, right? This is my fun way of, you know, that's isopropyl alcohol, right? So essentially, isopropanol is gonna come in, they're gonna attack like this. Oh, whoa, electrons are going on to oxygen. That's right, yet again, forming a tetrahedral intermediate. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna switch back to the isopropyl notation just to save some space. But remember, so in, in this situation, we want this to stay because we're, we're doing esterification, right? We're introducing this new piece and we eventually need to drive off water. So in this situation, we want this to stay and we want this to leave. So we just need to do a little proton shuffle. So you're gonna have H plus available. I'm just gonna be lazy and just have H plus. And I'm gonna be lazy and use water to help clean this up. So we're gonna have something like this. isopropyl OH2 plus, our good friend water. This is when our tetrahedral intermediate collapses, right? And we boot off water. I'm gonna skip a cleanup step. Our product is, so basically you form a carboxylic acid and then you just search and replace it right here. And I'll go ahead and draw it like this. Or if you wanted to draw it, you could have it like this. Either or works. Okay, but I like this problem because it, it brought back a little tidbit of OCHEM 1 into our lives. Okay, cool. Realize I might even just go a little bit over on time, but I might cut these uh, example, like the explanations a little shorter. All right, so we got this going on next. Okay, so here's some mean stuff coming at you. This reaction, the first thing we have going on is we have a car, a, you know, carbonyl, and it's an aldehyde. So in this first step, we're actually just doing imine formation. So we're imine pros by now. This is where all that hard work from, you know, yesteryear comes into handy. Comes in handy. One, two. Okay. Here's our imine. That's going to be step one. So this reaction is reductive amination. So basically you have an imine, and then you introduce this, again, mild reducing agent. This is a mild source of H minus. It's called cyano, uh, sodium cyanoboryl hydride. Again, a mouthful. But all that's gonna do is just, and I'm, I'm grossly simplifying the mechanism, but you're just gonna basically do this with some cleanup. But you basically just take a carbonyl, and wherever your carbonyl is, 
you just make it, uh, you make it an amine, and if your amine has anything off of it, like it does here, I almost just made a big oopsie, there you go. So it's basically the carbon you have here gets a bond to nitrogen, and then whatever that amine has off of it, here's our R group, one, two, one, two, three carbons, one, two, three. That's what we have going on. So for reductive amination, it's really just something you already know to do, form an amine, and then just reduce it down, and there you go. Okay, so I like this problem coming up too. Just. All right, let's take a look at this. O-ethyl. So on this problem, we got some sodium azide, and then we have some PPH3 and some water. Okay, so maybe what you're seeing is, okay, I see some azide and I see this. Perfect conditions to form an amine, right? We need this azide on our structure first, and I hope what you're seeing is in here, we see, okay, this carbon, while it is secondary, that little iffy, you know, part for SN2, I minus, super good leaving group, N3 minus is a super weak base, so we're at no risk of doing E2, we're definitely going to be doing SN2. So the very first part of this reaction is, do SN2, and I think here, personally, I think here's the trick. So after step one, careful, didn't touch the stereo center here, but we did do SN2 at this position, so we're not dashed anymore. We had to come from the back side, the azide did, which for this dash was a wedge. So the azide attaches as a wedge. And then when the PPH3 in the water does its job, again, we didn't touch our ethoxide piece right here. And we still have a wedge here. So you have an amine, but it's a wedged amine. Okay? I like this problem because it involves, again, it involves a piece of organic chemistry that's not at the forefront of your mind, maybe right now. Okay? Grease this all. Okay. All right. Looking at 18 more minutes, which is pretty good. Okay, I like this problem as well. So, if we have something like this, Okay, I think this is good. I'm a methyl. So it's an LDA. First step, second step, plus. Okay, so in this mechanism, uh, in this problem right here, I hope you're seeing we have a big fat diester, right? And in the first step, we see some LDA. So you're probably thinking we're making an ester enolate. And if you're thinking that, you're absolutely right. And we see some acidic workups. So you're probably thinking this is a Claisen condensation. You're absolutely right. And since it's going to be an intramolecular one, right, we're going to form one ester enolate and it's going to attack the other. It doesn't matter which one you work with. That's called a Diekmann condensation. Maybe some of you have learned this. Maybe some of you haven't. I hope I spelled this right. But a Diekmann condensation is just a Claisen but intramolecular. So it's something you already know, different name. So it doesn't matter where you start off with. I'm going to just generate my... Right, our ester enolate will be generated by doing this. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. We know this will swing back down. It's this carbon we're gonna be bonding from. Kick these up. So what I want to do is just at least draw this thing. And I really strongly encourage you to start numbering. If you're gonna be, if you don't do it, give it a try. I promise you it only helps. So from this carbon, number one, we are making a six-membered ring. So it's all carbon, so I'm just gonna go ahead and draw a six member, no, a pent or sorry, hexagon, oof, shapes. Do one, the one, two, three, four, five, and six thing. On carbon number one, outside of the ring, I have my reformed carbonyl carbon and oxygen. And so that's this carbon right here. And then I have an O-methyl. So I have my ester piece right here. Cool. I'll remember this as carbon number one, 
Cool. Nothing on two, nothing on three, nothing on four, nothing on five, and on six. It's six that has this O minus, as well as this O methyl. Okay? So remember, we have a tetrahedral intermediate, and now I'm going to collapse it. And we kick off our leaving group. That's not so great, but remember, it's because we have made a promise to it, essentially, that we will give it a proton to pick up. So we have this. And remember, it's this carbon that has to foot the bill when uh, methoxide comes back. And luckily, we do have an H, so this Dieckmann condensation will go forward. So that's, this is all after step one, right? O-methyl, uh, this, and then I'm just going to go ahead, we'll have a proton pick up right there. So the final product that we're looking for is the wonderful ring right here. Outside the ring we have this ester. Okay, I'll just give you a second to look at this. So again, nothing new here, just creating an ester enolate. It sees something it wants to attack within the molecule itself. It goes after it. Stay organized. Number your carbons. There's your tetrahedral intermediate. Collapse that sucker. Evaluate whether or not the condensation can proceed. And yes, it can. And then, then you have some acidic workup. No big deal. So, a Dieckmann condensation. Okay. So, what do we got? Okay. So what I'm going to do is do maybe one more regular problem, and then I want to do a couple synthesis problems. Okay. Okay, so what I, I really like... Actually, we'll just do, this is a pretty basic one, but we'll give a means their, uh, their due, due diligence. So if you were to see something as, as basic as this, and especially in excess, as much propyl bromide ever, just know one thing with the means is you can alkylate them, but they will alkylate as, basically they will continue to do SN2 and alkylate themselves as much as possible. So if you had a problem like this, basically you're just going to be doing this four times. So what you'll end up having is an, a quaternary amine with four of the alkyl groups you've tossed in. That's positive, and then you'll have the corresponding leaving group. This is an ammonium salt. I don't know, I've seen that happen every once in a while. People think that's worthwhile to put on tests, whatever. Okay, I really like this problem though. Okay, so in this problem right here, we see we have this beta dicarbonyl, right? 1,3 dicarbonyl. We see we just have base at first. So all that's going to happen in this first step is just some alpha deprotonation. It's super, this is a super, super acidic proton because it's wedged in between two carbonyls, right? Lots of resonance. So the very first thing we're going to have is a negative charge right here, okay? Now, if we look at step number two, this, I hope you're seeing this. This is an enone or a beta unsaturated carbonyl. Same thing, synonyms. Remember, hard nucleophiles will just go ahead and attack straight here when you have an enone, but soft nucleophiles will do a 1,4 addition. And since this is just an alpha carbon, it's a soft nucleophile, not a hard nucleophile. So if we look at this, what's going to happen here is that this carbon is going to be super interested in attacking here, then these electrons bounce here and then these bounce up. This is a Michael addition. 
is we have enolate doing a 1,4 addition, okay? So if we're going to look at the aftermath of that, didn't touch this carb meal, didn't touch this carb meal. I'm going to draw this sucker straight up. A bond from here to here. So I have a dot carbon here. The other dot carbon is a part of my cyclopentene ring. There you go. It's not the prettiest, but it works. And this is, okay, do four, three, two, and one. So four, three, two, O minus, double bond right there. And in true Michael addition fashion, right, this enolate will just flip to a carbonyl. So our final product is And remember the built-in check. Michael additions produce 1,5 dicarbonyls. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Take this to the bank. That's a winner. Okay? Cool. So, I want to just skip to the synthesis section now. And again, if sorry if I'm racing fast, but... I will put this right up on Joechem right when we're finished so you can browse each problem as you know slowly as you want, pause it, all that jazz. Just trying to fit all this good stuff in for you, all y'all. Okay? So, two synthesis problems, and then we will call it quits because we have eight minutes left. So we are no longer in problem city. We are in synthesis city. Population us. Cool. All right. What I like, I like this first problem. If you're wondering if I like all the problems, the answer is absolutely because all these problems are so much fun. Okay. Okay. So here's our problem. And one additional piece of information is that we can use anything. We can use four carbons or less. Okay, so that's kind of cool. You can grab some extra stuff off the shelf if we need it. The very first rule that we have in OCHEM is counter carbons, right? So we have one, two, three, and then we do have these you know, extra pieces in these right here. However, I'm not going to count them because I don't see them over there. So I do see I have a core of kind of three carbons. Like here, I'll just do three, and then if we want to count the extras, there's two and four here. So it's almost like we have uh, seven. And in our product, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Six carbons, okay. So this is a really interesting problem, and I'll tell you what, like whenever I first saw the synthesis, I think this is one of those things where you might need to see one before you kind of pick up a pattern on it. But let's start working backwards, because clearly, I hope what you're maybe seeing is we don't see any carbonyls at the end, and we see that we have lost one. It might be a perfect decarboxylation situation, okay? So, what I want to do is let's take this one step back. I'm going to kind of work like this. Clearly, we have an alcohol, which means we must we probably had something from a higher oxidative state. So, maybe I have a carboxylic acid. And I know I can make this happen with my trusty friend lithium aluminum hydride with acidic workup, okay? All right, so I have my carboxylic acid. Now, I hope what maybe you're thinking is this would be perfect to, if we step this back, okay? Clearly, we don't see another carbonyl. So one thing to think of is if I took this back one step, is there any... Maybe I could draw what this was before I did a decarboxylation. And maybe that, if it, it could be wrong, but let me just draw it and see if that gives me a clear path to going back to my initial structure. So if I had something like this, if I, I'll do kind of doodle this up here. What if I had, I always like to have this type of structure right here where it's like, here's kind of like our three carbons up here. And then you might have some type of R group, right? In this case, maybe it's, three carbons, and then, so these would be like, kind of like the two carbons right here. We're going to lose one of these. One, two, three, four. So maybe I have 
one, two, three, four. Because if I had these reagents right here, if I had some, you know, some heat for this exactly to go back, basically I'm just going to lose this, and I'll have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six. That looks pretty good to me, because let me even I'll, here. So here I'll let's just say we're going to roll with this. So really, all I've done from this step to this step is assume I had an extra carbon beforehand, right? Because here. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is, you know, I'm going to lose CO2. That's the decarboxylation. And if I even were to take this one step back before, right, how do I get closer to this? Well, if I had some NaOH and water here, right, I don't think it's any stretch of the imagination to see how I could have come from my diester starting material. One, two, three, four, right? Because all this does is ester hydrolysis. I basically, well, this would be a first step, and then we need a second step of acid because this would give me, the first step would give me carboxylates, right? And then the second step would propagate this up to add my acids, my carboxylic acids. So then you might be asking yourself, how do I get from here to here? Well, this is super easy. We can use four carbons or less, and thank goodness, one, two, three, and four. We just need to make this position nucleophilic, so if I just toss in some LDA, literally the only protons LDA is going to be interested in are these two right here. So that gives me nucleophilic character, the alpha carbon. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull out of my back pocket some butyl bromide, some butyl chloride, some butyl iodide, and this would happen. So what's super weird is that it almost didn't help to count carbons here necessarily, but what I think was important is that there was, a, a, you know, it was slightly disguised at the end, but basically after going one step back, we saw we lost a complete unit, like a carbonyl unit, if you will. And I hope maybe the decarboxylation is something you might look for a little bit more going forward. This is actually the ending of the melonic ester synthesis. So if you haven't looked at that video on Joe Chem, check it out. Okay, one more. We will call quits, gang. All right. Okay. So let's take a look at this. So we got this, and we will be making if only whiteboards were just bigger, well they are bigger than this, but if only I could fit one bigger than this. Really like this problem, I'm a big fan. <laughs> As if you're surprised. Okay, so we got this right here. So if I look at my starting material, uh, the only difference here is that we're just gonna be looking, you can use anything three carbons or less. So if I look at my starting material, I see one, two, three, four, four carbons. And here I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, whoop, one, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, nine carbons. All right, so it's looking very promising to, actually, let me just make sure I didn't do anything dumb. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, what did I do here? Hold on, sorry, gang. One second. I'm thinking on my paper, I lost some carbons. And that is not cool. Oh, dumb, dumb, sorry. Okay, so one thing, one combo that could work is two of these and a one carbon piece. Math is hard sometimes, okay? But let's check this out. So one thing that I did not kind of go over in the amines thing, but I hope if you're doing amines that you've seen before, is something called the monic reaction. And what the monic reaction is, is you have an imine that gets attacked by an enol. 
And what you end up with, characteristically, is you have carbonyl, and from the alpha carbon right here, so you'll, you'd be attacking from this carbon, from your enol, you'll kind of see like a one, two, like from, from here, from the alpha, beta, you'll get like a, a nitrogen in your gamma position. So this is textbook monic reaction. And I'm sorry if like you all, not everyone has doing a means for this test, but so for the monic reaction, all you really need is some, you know, some acid to keep it going. But it's again, it's enol plus imine. So let's see if we can break this up. So I see one, two, three, four right there. One, two, three, four, five. So maybe I can work with this, but a natural division point looks like right here. So it looks like this was my enol. So let me go ahead and draw this. That's my enol. And if we were to then look at the amine or the imine piece, it looks like this looks pretty safe. Uh, yeah, and it'll it'll even be a plus charge right there, but whatever. It uh, here's our imine. Whoop. So basically, how this goes, you swing down. We attack the carbon that's double bonded to the electronegative nitrogen, that's how this goes, okay? So, now that we've done this, we can kind of take this in two chunks. Our synthesis problem just got much simpler. So what I'm gonna do is focus on the enol for a second. So, all I had to do to make this work was just throw in some acid. So this came from a carbonyl, and the carbonyl is an aldehyde, right? Well, well, well. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. We know how to make this happen. If I do diwall and acidic workup, we know that this goes through an imine intermediate that then flips back to its carbonyl form, so bam, done. Now we need to do our imine. So remember, imines form with an, an, like a primary amine, or NH3, and a carbonyl. So if we look at one, our, we see this was our imine right here. So I'm thinking we had a one carbon carbonyl, right? This would be this sucker right here, okay? And all we need to make this work is just some water and uh, acid. So that, which this is less than three carbons, so we can just take this off the shelf. And then we are on the hook for this one, two, three, four uh, piece right here, okay? So this is a primary amine, makes perfect sense, that's how we did our imine formation. Okay, so we need to make this work. How do we do this? Well, super, super, super easy. We just need to take this nitrile to uh, an amine, so just whip out a slightly stronger set of reduction, and there we have it. All right, gang. It looks like it is just a smidge over 5.30, so if you're still on the, on the live stream, thank you so much. If you're watching to this point, if you're a fan of Geochem, I appreciate you so, so much. What I, I just ask is if you have any friends taking Ochem, I'm a terrible marketer. You are all my front lines of uh, word of mouth is super important, so if, if you think someone could benefit from the website, send them that way. And like I said, if you guys, I know it's hard to remember, but even if you don't care uh, about the channel after this year, if you can subscribe, that'd be huge. I need subscribers. I need to get to that 1,000 mark on YouTube so I can start live streaming from YouTube. So thanks again. It's been amazing, an honor. And again, next Sunday, a week from today, I'm doing another live review. It's going to be on a lot of biological stuff. So it's going to be on the second half of benzene chemistry, so if so, substitutions and stuff like that. But then we're doing carbohydrates. We're doing peptides. We're doing DNA. We're doing... Uh, heterocycles. So I'll see you next week. Thanks for tuning into the live stream. Get your problems ready, but have a great Sunday and stay safe. And I'll see you all in the next video.